This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Falling Sky. Falling Sky was released in 2016 by GMT Games and designed by Andrew Ronke and Volko Ronke. This game supports up to four players and takes three to six hours to play. Welcome back to part four of the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Falling Sky. In this episode, we will discuss the Winter Phase. As you may remember from previous episodes, the event deck is organized into years, each separated by a Winter card. Throughout the game, players draw from the deck and work their way down the current year. Eventually, the Winter card will appear on deck. When this happens, the Frost Marker is placed on the current event card. Frost is a reminder to prepare for the end of the year and prohibits marches. Once the last event card is played through, the winter card becomes active. Players will then conduct each phase of winter as shown on the flow boxes below the sequence of play area. In this episode, we will cover each of these phases and learn how to close out the current year and prepare for the next. We've got quite a few things to cover, so let's get started. The first part of winter is the victory phase. In this phase, if any faction has met its victory condition, the game ends. If you're playing through the last year of the game and this is the final winter, then the faction with the highest victory margin wins the game. Let's recap the victory conditions with this clip from the first episode. The Roman player's victory condition is to subjugate the Gallic tribes. If the Roman player can subdue more than 15 of the 30 tribes on the game board and hold that status until winter, then they win the game. Subdued tribes, dispersed tribes, and allied tribes all count towards these victory points. The Belgic player's goal is to buffer their nation from Rome's influence with tribal alliances. If the Belgic player can secure alliances with more than 15 of the 30 tribes on the game board and hold that status until winter, then they win the game. Regions that the Belgics control, allied tribes, and Belgic citadels all count towards these victory points. One quick note, when the Belgic player takes control of a region, they receive the points shown at the top of the control space. Also be aware that any disperse markers will subtract from this control total. The Averni player's victory conditions are twofold. First, the Averni need greater than 8 tribes to support them in revolt. Averni allied tribes and citadels count towards this objective. Second, the Averni must humiliate Caesar by keeping over 6 Roman legions off the map. Legions killed in battle in the Fallen Legions box or those on the legion track count towards this goal. If the Averni can achieve both of these objectives and hold them through winter, they win the game. The Adui victory condition is tracked at the bottom of their force display. The Adui player's goal is to rule the Gallic region as Rome's proxy. To accomplish this goal, they must secure allied tribes and citadels greater than the faction that has the greatest number of tribes and citadels on the game board. As a note, Roman forts are not counted for this victory condition. The German phase allows the non-playable German faction to multiply, spread, steal, and slaughter across the game map. Essentially, players will work through a flow of commands and special abilities in the following order to support this German behavior. First conduct a rally command for the Germans. Starting with the Germanic homeland region spaces, Germans will rally whenever possible. Then the Germans will rally wherever they're able in other regions on the game map. Next, form a group of Germanic warbands to march out of each region. Germans in regions that do not have German control or have just enough German warbands to have control will not move. March out with as many warbands as possible without losing Germanic control of that region. Move the largest groups first and only into at most one region then adjust control of those regions as needed. 
Finally, flip all Germanic warbands to hidden or remove their scouted markers. Warbands that did not move to another region are assumed to have marched inside that region. Basically, they change positions in the region to shake off scouted markers or hide themselves again. Next, Germans will raid with as many Germanic warbands as able per the following. Raid only against factions that have more than zero resources and no fort or citadel, and only until they reach zero resources. And raid against players before non-player factions. Otherwise, choose randomly among target factions within a region. Finally, Germans will battle with the ambush special ability in each region where the Germans currently are able to do so, only wherever hidden German warbands are with another faction with fewer hidden warbands, essentially following the ambush rule, and would cause an enemy loss. Then adjust control as needed. Battle should be conducted with player factions before non-player factions. And choose the order of battles among equal candidates randomly. In the quarters phase, each faction must find region spaces for their warbands and auxilia to quarter in during the winter. Quartering instructions for each faction adhere to the following rules. In general, most warbands and auxilia cannot quarter in region spaces with devastated markers where no faction has control or a region under the control of the Germans. Factions can quarter in safe region spaces that are under their control or in some cases where another faction who has control agrees to let them quarter there. Also remember, as factions find regions to quarter in during the winter, this may also affect the control of region spaces. Also, factions may transfer resources between each other during this phase. Now, let's walk through the specifics for each faction which follows a specific order. First, resolve the quarters phase for the German faction. All Germanic warbands in devastated regions without German allies and outside Germania relocate to Germania. Roll a die and relocate all of them to either the Sugambri region, the northern half of Germania, on a die result of 1, 2, or 3, or the Ubi region, the southern half of Germania, on a die result of 4, 5, or 6. Next, resolve the quarters phase for each Gallic faction beginning with the Belgics. Gallic factions may move warbands and leaders to adjacent, undevastated regions that they control. Or, they can move those game pieces to a region space another faction controls as long as that faction agrees to grant them shelter during the winter. Then roll a die for each warband that they have in devastated regions without their own ally or citadel. Remove the warband if the die result is a 1 through 3, otherwise they survive the winter. Then it's time to resolve the quarters phase for the Roman faction. The Romans may move their legions, auxilia, and leader to adjacent undevastated regions with Roman control. Or they can move to a region space another faction controls if they agree to grant them shelter during the winter. Then, they may move Legion Auxilia with secure supply lines to Provincia. After that, they move their leader from any region to Provincia. Finally, any Legion or Auxilia outside Provincia must try to survive through the Gallic winter. They have two options. First, each Roman allied tribe and fort can provide shelter for one Legion or Auxilia. After that, any additional game pieces in the region space must pay. One resource per game piece with an ally, two resources without, and if the region is devastated, double this cost, which means two to four resources. If the faction cannot pay or is not willing to, roll a die for each legion or auxilia without shelter. On a die result of one through three, the game piece is eliminated. 4 through 6, they survive. Remember to place dead legions in the fallen legions box.
The harvest phase is where each faction collects resources for their tribal holdings and then updates their resource marker with the results at the top of the game board. The Roman harvest is a repeat of their victory condition. They receive one resource point for each tribe that is subdued, dispersed, or allied. The Gallic faction's harvest follows a different process. For the Adui harvest, each allied tribe and citadel is worth two points each. The Adui are unique among the Gallic tribes in that they also receive four resource points for river tolls. The Averni and Belgic tribes follow the same formula as the Adui, with the exception that they do not receive any river tolls. Once each faction's resource markers are updated, then the harvest phase is complete and it's time to move to the next phase. The Senate phase allows the Roman Senate to weigh in on the Gallic campaign and send reinforcements to Gaul depending on the Roman player's performance. Caesar's success or failure with the Gallic campaign will have an impact on the amount of support he receives from the Senate in the form of auxilia and legions. Note, I'm referring to Caesar here, but the rules still apply if Caesar has been killed and the Roman faction is under the leadership of a successor. The Senate process is all recorded on the Senate and Legions track in the lower right hand corner of the game board. First let's look at the Senate track to understand how all this works. The Senate has three moods regarding the Gallic campaign which serves as a form of barometer. The higher the Roman Senate marker rises, the greater their anger. At adulation, the lowest level, the Senate loves Caesar. At Intrigue, they're concerned about what's going on in Gaul. At Uproar, they're furious about how things are being handled. Furthermore, the extreme ends of this scale can be cemented by extremely bad or good progress. This is represented by the firm side of the Senate marker. For example, if Caesar is performing poorly in Gaul and the Senate marker is already at Uproar, if the Senate marker rises again, it is flipped to the firm side. This means it will take two improvements to get out of uproar. One to flip the marker back to normal, and then a second change to move it down to intrigue. The opposite is true if the marker is at the other end of the scale on adulation. In this way, Caesar can bank some goodwill, flip the Senate marker to firm, and keep it from rising as fast. The Senate marker shifts as the result of two game actions. First, if a faction plays the event on a card, this may shift the Senate marker. Second, during the Senate phase, the Senate's mood will adjust the Senate marker based on the number of victory points scored by the Roman faction. If Rome's victory points are less than 9, then the Roman Senate marker rises one level. If Rome's victory points are greater than 13, then lower the Roman Senate marker by one level. If Roman victory points are between 10 and 12, move the Senate marker one level towards Intrigue, the middle box. Ultimately, the Senate's mood regarding Caesar's progress in the war will directly impact the amount of military support he receives in the next year of the Gallic War. The Senate awards support in the form of legions and bonus auxilia. There is one exception to all of this. If there are any Legion game pieces in the Fallen Legion's box, then the Senate marker cannot be moved down. The Roman Senate does not easily forgive Caesar for losing their elite fighters. Now that we have some background on how the Senate works, let's walk through the steps of the Senate phase. After the Senate marker has been adjusted due to the victory points of the Roman faction, it's time to manage the Legions, if any, in the Fallen Legion's box. There are a total of 12 legions in the game. These legions cycle through three states. They can be operational on the game map, deceased in the Fallen Legions box, which also counts towards an Averni victory condition, or queued on the legion track waiting for the Senate to authorize their entry into Gaul. First, the Roman faction will move legions from the legion box onto the legion track. Count the number of legions in the Fallen Legions box, divide this number in half, and round down. 
This is the number of legions that will remain in the Fallen Legion box until spring. For example, if there are three legions in the Fallen Legion's box, then one legion remains in the box, half of three is 1.5, which rounds down to one, and the other two legions are moved to the legion track. Once half of the Fallen Legions have been added to the legion track, then move all the legions on the legion track to Provincia. As I said in an earlier episode of this series, legions can be a blessing and a curse. By now, hopefully you're starting to see why. However, be aware that the Roman player may not decline these legions, nor are any legions removed from the map in this phase. Also remember to adjust control in the Provincia region, if necessary, when you add these game pieces. Finally, if Caesar, or the Roman leader successor, is personally in Provincia during winter, then he receives bonus auxilia from the Senate. However, the number of bonus auxilia is determined by the mood of the Senate. If the Roman Senate is at uproar, he receives three auxilia. Intrigue, four auxilia. And adulation, five auxilia. And once this step is completed, the Senate phase ends. The spring phase cleans up the game board and prepares players for the next year of gameplay. To prepare for the coming year, players will complete the following steps as necessary. First, if any leaders have fallen in battle, it's time to place their successors. A named leader is identified by a symbol on the end of their game piece. When a named leader is replaced by a successor, the game piece is flipped to show the blank end. Successors tend to have limited abilities compared to their named predecessor. Successors can be placed on the map where the faction has game pieces or a home region's rally or recruit symbol. Next, remove the remaining fallen legions from their box and place them on the legions track. After this, remove all scouted markers and then flip all revealed warbands and auxilia to hidden. Next, remove all devastated markers from the game board. After that, remove all dispersed gathering markers. Then, flip all dispersed tribe markers to their dispersed gathering side. As you can see, once a dispersed marker is placed, it takes two winters to remove them. After this, place all faction markers in the eligible box. After that, reveal the next active card from the draw deck, and then reveal the next card on deck. And with that, the spring phase is complete, and the next year is ready to be played. Now that we've covered the winter phase, you should be ready to play your own game of Falling Sky. Falling Sky, along with all other coin games, are very challenging but ultimately rewarding experiences. This was the most requested game on the channel to break down the rules for, so hopefully this series has helped you guys out. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.